Good afternoon, everyone. I see that Remo, the platform that you, we are using, is starting to let participants in. Uh, this is the first time we're using this platform. So to be honest, I was a bit worried since nobody was joining. Um, but I was confident that out of the 100 and something uh, registrations that we had, someone will join. Um, I hope the registration process was not very difficult. Again, this is a new platform, and I will show you a bit later why we're using it. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, my name is Dan Stefanica. I am the head of projects here at EHPA. Um, I hope you know about EHPA, or if not, I hope you have or will have the interest to find out more about us. Um, my team is very much uh, geared towards projects and also geared towards, um, of course, meeting stakeholders that are um, relevant in participating in projects, as well as um, suitable and interested and stakeholders that basically um, we can um, uh, we can cooperate with and ensure um, that our vision for renewable heating and cooling and the part the major part that we see for heat pumps um, is going to be uh, to be done the next slide please um, so we're using uh, this platform called remo and i know now it just maybe looks like any other platform like zoom or go to webinar or any of those uh, you know dozens that you've seen before uh, but actually, it's very special, to be honest. Um, it's a networking uh, platform that basically, uh, when the networking will start, will change completely its appearance. Uh, the picture that you see on the screen, the little, the little blue dots, let's call them like that, uh, they're actually seats. And each of those are a table, a virtual table, where you can sit down, get up. Um, there's also different floors. Um, so the platform is very, very nice, and my colleague Serena will explain uh, before we begin the networking event how exactly it works. Um, there's also a Q and A uh, bar, so there's you have on the right a little blue button. If you open it, you'll see that there's a Q and A box, and you can type there your questions for the for me or the other speakers that you will uh, that you will uh, hear. Um, but Again, because it's a networking event, uh, you can just ask them your questions live. Just sit at the table with them. And if you want to learn more, just, just talk to them live. Um, of course, when you had to enter the platform, I would guess, again, this is the first time we're, uh, we're using it, um, you, would you had to make a profile, maybe put a picture on, maybe fill in some, some, some um, information about your LinkedIn or your email address. Uh, this is all so that the networking is more useful and just just easier to do. If at any point you want to change what you did, you probably have a picture, or if you didn't put a picture, you have like some initials um, on the right up corner. I think you can edit those at any time. But I would put as much information there as possible so that the people you're talking to at, at the virtual table uh, know exactly who you are or know how to get uh, in touch with you afterwards. The next slide, please. I, uh, you'll have to excuse us. We have to say new slide all the time. Uh, the next one, please. Uh, because the, um, the platform itself doesn't have the functionality so for me to, to change the slide. Uh, so just a little bit about the agenda now. Uh, so this is just the welcome. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the strategic research and innovation platform for RHC, uh, the, the project that is doing these matchmaking events. Uh, then we'll have a one hour session uh, where we try to find examples that um, basically build upon the Syria. And we have David, we have Barbara, Julian, and Atsin, all of them with either a project or work that their company is doing or a product that their, that their company is developing to fulfill the, the strategic research and innovation agenda that we see for heat pumps. The next slide, please. Then, of course, there'll be a 15 minutes Q&A. 
Uh, so if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A box. But again, you can just ask them live. Then we'll have a 10 minutes virtual coffee break. Uh, hopefully you will have some, uh, you know, real coffee, not just virtual coffee. We did not find a way in the platform to give you coffee. Um, then there go there's going to be my colleague Serena that will explain to you what our project team is doing, uh, what calls are we interested in, uh, what calls are there at all, right? What funding opportunities there are, as well as how to actually use the remote platform so you can get as much as possible from the, from the networking event. Then one hour, it will be networking event. And again, my colleague will tell you more about that. And there'll be 10 minutes of, um, a closing just just to get uh, to get uh, our opinions about the platform and the calls the next slide please um, again feel free to sit at any table uh, my colleagues from uh, keymark are here my colleagues from the policy team are here so if you ever wanted to, to speak to them might be a good idea to just sit at a table with them so what is the rhc platform Many of you prob probably already know that the RHC platform it's, uh, is actually a European technology and innovation platform, and it stands for Renewable Heating and Cooling. Uh, EHPA, along with other partners, uh, industry associations such as our, us, um, work on this uh, platform, and we think it's, it's very useful for, for the European Union, for, um, for the world in general, let's say, for technology development, um, as well as for its members. The next slide, please. Um, it has several goals uh, to develop um, working relationships with all sorts of stakeholders, um, to identify uh, what are the innovation barriers, what are the challenges, and most importantly, hopefully, how to solve them. The next slide, please. Um, of course, it also has um, a lot of features. So if you go to its website, uh, you can see a projects database. The projects database, if you have a project that is in renewable heating and cooling, next slide, please. Please feel free to submit it. There's a free app, free submission. It's very easy to do. And your project will join the uh, RHC projects community. The next slide, please, that you can see on screen. Um, and we have over 140 projects that are already there. Um, the beauty of it is basically that um, you can find the projects very easily with a filter. And also, we are trying to expand this um, so to give it even more functionality. Uh, it's also a good idea to become a member of RxC. There are many advantages to it uh, and many opportunities for members. The next slide, please. Um, and uh, RSC does a lot of documents. So it did a vision, a vision to uh, for renewable heating and cooling, a 100% renewable heating and cooling by 2050. Um, it did a strategic research and innovation agenda for all the all the technologies involved in the platform. Uh, and it's now working on. Okay, so we have a vision. Uh, we have what needs to be researched and developed. How do we deploy the technologies? The next slide, please. Uh, as part of it, and of course, all these documents are public. They're, they're uh, publicly accessible on, online. The next slide, please. Um, there was a strategic research and innovation agenda for heat pumps. Um, that's easily downloadable if you have your phone, but I will for sure change the slide very quickly. Uh, you can actually just scan the QR code and it will take you there. The next slide, please. Um, so basically, uh, we did, and uh, myself, my colleague Irene, that is here, um, we worked a lot on this along with our stakeholders, and we did we did a strategic research and innovation agenda uh, based on the life cycle um, analysis of heat pumps. Next slide, please. So we took took a look at uh, all the uh, let's say parts that go into uh, communicating about heat pumps, designing heat pumps. Uh, manufacturing them, deploying them, uh, maintaining and operating them, and of course, um, trying to update update them, uh, replace them with a better heat pump in, I don't know, 15 years maybe. Um, and again, the circle uh, begins. Um, we gathered this data through, well, the, the little blue dots there are actually virtual post-its that we gathered through a 
tool called Mural. Um, this is basically, you know, because of the pandemic, can really have uh, physical, physical close proximity contact. Uh, so we have to use these tools, but they prove very useful. And there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of interest and a lot of ideas on what should go into this uh, into this agenda, from um, uh, a lot of stakeholders that are relevant to to our field, the heat pump field in our case. And of course, the HPA um, has a research and innovation committee that is open to any relevant stakeholder. Um, and feel free, if you're interested in this, to join. Uh, the, the Research and Innovation Committee, uh, next slide please, uh, takes place along with the heat pump technology panel that is part of the um, uh, Renewable Heating and Cooling Platform. Um, and we have around, I would say more than 70 stakeholders from all, all, all around the world, not just the European Union, and all sorts of, um, let's say market segments so from robotics to aerodynamics uh, to uh, renewable electricity generation and so on um, and we talk about many things and i think if you're uh, if you're interested in research and innovation if you're interested in projects that are dealing with it if you're interested in projects that are already running and want to want to have some inspiration or some networking and if you want to uh, learn more about rhc joining the uh, RNI committee of the HP or the heat pump technology panel of RHC uh, is, a, is a really nice idea. All the meetings are online. They always take two hours. And um, I guarantee there's going to be no spam emails in that. I make that guarantee to everyone. Um, just, to, just to look at the what, the, what is this uh, strategic research and innovation agenda? Uh, Dan is talking about you know, another 100, 200 page uh, document full of you know, uh, graphs and formulas that uh, you cannot really um, um, understand very well or you know. Um, it's actually it's actually a very a very concise document. It's only about thirty pages long, um, and it has a lot of pictures in it. Let's say um, it's for stakeholders that are not very technical minded, um, and it tries to um, uh, to tackle again all the segments that would be uh, thought about in a uh, in um, making a heat pump. So how do we communicate it to the to the to the user? Um, how do we design it? Uh, do we design it with modularity in mind? Do we design it with circularity? I mean, for sure, we design it with all of this. Uh, how do we manufacture it? Do we manufacture it keeping in mind, you know, that um, all the pieces are standardized so that they are easily replaceable? Um, do we use 3D printing, for example? Uh, do we use quality control that is made by robots scanning the, the products? The next slide, please. Um, do we? How do we install it? How do we make uh, a heat pump be installed as uh, fast and as efficiently as possible? Uh, how do we train the installers that are currently maybe installing boilers to also install heat pumps or install heat pumps exclusively? Then, um, how how is this uh, heat pump maintained? I mean. Uh, we're all very happy to use our phone to check on things. Can we do that for a heat pump? Can we do? Can we connect it to the cloud? Or what is the security aspect of that? Um, and then replacement and upgrading heat as a service, and um, you know all the circularity and making sure that while replacing the heat pump, all the components are recycled, and you get um, another heat pump and an implementation plan that just looks at another field that kind of has or had the same issues that we had, which was the electric uh, vehicle market. The next slide, please. So feel free to, uh, to take a look into it. Uh, the document will be updated all the time. At least that's what we have in mind. Uh, it's not just going to be a static document. Actually, we, um, we plan to print very few copies of it from an environmentally standpoint, but also because uh, we would like to update it yearly and keep it um, as updated as possible. So whenever there's a, um, we meet a policymaker, for example, we can be like, this is what we need. This is the information that is coming from our stakeholders. Uh, here you go. So that is my short introduction. Please take a look at the RHC platform. Consider being a member or submitting your project. And with that being said, 
And of course, I'll be at the networking event, so you can ask me more. Um, I would like to introduce you to uh, David, um, and I will just read a little bit his bio that he wrote here. So David Burgonan is working for Alouen as manager of the Sun People Project, a project financed by the Interreg France Channel England program. He has a PhD in biomedical engineering. He has more than 15 years of experience in applied research and development, and he was and is a valued member of the RNI committee, heat pump technology panel, and a, uh, the a person that helped us with the Syria. So, David, the floor, the virtual camera is yours. Please tell my colleague when to change the slides. Thank and you, Dan. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction. Do you hear me well? Yes? Yeah. Okay. All right, everybody. So, um, I might switch my camera off at some point uh, to save some bandwidth, but I'm ready to answer questions uh, during the presentation, after the presentation. Feel free to interrupt. Um, can you, uh, next slide, please. So, as Dan said, uh, I'm project manager of uh, Interreg French Channel England program project called Some People. Some people uh, started in uh, August uh, 2019, and so it's soon to be uh, to be closed. We were, we will be entering the deliverable phase uh, after that. Uh, I'm uh, running that within Alouen, so uh, Alouen is a local energy climate agency in southern Brittany, in western France. Uh, and um, I'm doing this with, of course, a team of partners I will present briefly. Uh, my talk is about implementing heat as a service, and I will briefly also mention the implementation of this service within energy communities in Great Britain. Next slide, please. So, uh, briefly regarding this project, it's a, it's a micro project, uh, two years. 500,000 uh, euros budget. Um, it's made of four, a partnership of four partners uh, with Alouen, as I said, as lead partner and a large local authority called Climate City Council. So in the west, so, uh, east, south, east, south, western, south, sorry, of Great Britain. Uh, it's and it's uh, it's cooperative energy community company called Climus Energy Community. In France, we are also uh, uh, collaborating with a small and medium enterprise called ASIO. They are providing training for people interested in developing their own energy systems uh, based on, in particular, solar thermal panels. So the goal of the project, as I said, is about uh, heat, um, next generation heat energy services. And we'll be dem we have demonstrated those on existing sites. So it's a very practical project. But we have also conducted some in-depth studies on what uh, could be uh, new and what which kind of new energy service could be developed uh, in Lorient, in Brittany, and in Plymouth. Uh, I will briefly present so this energy service, but bear in mind that behind that there is also lots of technical knowledge. Uh, we have uh, in investigated what I call the new solar uh, technology platform made of uh, heat pumps and solar, uh, more traditional solar uh, technologies integrated together. Next slide, please. So very briefly to, uh, as a recap of what is a, an energy service, I think it's very important to remember that currently we buy energy mostly as a good. We buy uh, energy from the grid, either electricity or gas. And with that, we then operate machines that deliver services for us in, in our homes, for example. Uh, when you think energy as a service, you, you no longer spend your money on a good. You spend your money on some uh, contract that a company is selling you and that will provide you with what you really want. That means, for example, comfort. And uh, the way of measuring that is not by measuring a physical a quantity like kilowatt hours, but rather to measure several success indicators that could be very different according to homeowner to homeowner. Um, and uh, I will not dig into this. Uh, from a customer perspective, I think the service removes 
two major difficulties that the market is facing right now. First is it removes the upfront cost. So you do not have to play the investor role. And in particular, when you're an individual uh, homeowner, it can be a very heavy burden. And you do not have also to play the project owner builder uh, role, which is sometimes very complex and make people uncomfortable because they are, they are not familiar with those new, new technologies and they prefer to rely on, let's say, traditional solutions that are unfortunately um, uh, climate unfriendly like gas boilers. So we believe by removing those two major difficulties, we can also broaden the, the market for those new um, um, zero carbon technologies. Next slide, please. So in this project, we investigated a service on a specific set of um, apartments and individual homes in Lorient. So what I will present now is focusing on this type of apartments and, and homes. It's not a general service on a generic, uh, I would say, building stock. And during the project, we also investigated what uh, the commercial building sector, so either public, like uh, local authority buildings or um, um, this or, or this kind of, uh, of, uh, of of pools. I mean, uh, sport places and so on. But also uh, private uh, buildings like uh, uh, enterprise um, uh, hostels and so on. Uh, if we focus on this very specific type of apartments and homes, we uh, designed a, a, a methodology of comparison of several systems. So I apologize in, uh, that my uh, graphs are in French because I couldn't translate it. It was very time consuming, but just to give you the, uh, uh, a few hints about how to uh, French uh, called uh, it pumps. It pumps in French is PAC, P-A-C, so translate PAC by HP and you will understand mo mostly what is this uh, about. Uh, so when we compare the technologies uh, and we uh, consider what we call the global coefficient of performance, so I would say the energy efficiency of the whole, we already see that uh, what we I call the new solar approach is winning by far. So uh, you have a very efficient 4.53 uh, COP when you integrate uh, heat pump, uh, solar thermal and solar PV technologies together. In comparison, your, your traditional gas boiler is 0 0.73. Next slide, please. Uh, and of course, this has an impact of on the CO2 emissions because uh, the goal of this project, the Sun People project, is also to decarbonize heat in, in homes and domestic hot water. And so we really focus on the most efficient technologies for that. And we obviously see from this graph that uh, if we take, if we look at the gas boiler as a reference, so the top uh, brown bar and you compare it with the integrated uh, heat pump uh, solar thermal and solar pv solution at the bottom you have a 95 savings in co2 emissions uh, for in, for information in france uh, there was some evaluation of the level of emission reduction we need to commit to in the uh, residential building sector uh, and to be to under the paris agreement so Roughly, we have to save 75% of the current emissions before 2030, so 10 years for that. So let, let us consider that without relying on uh, heat pumps and the combination of heat pumps and, um, and uh, solar technologies with a grid electricity that is sufficiently low carbon, of course, you will not achieve that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, if you look at the global cost, so in French we call that global cost as the sum of the cost of installation, maintenance, and energy together. Uh, and you look at the different technologies I, pre I presented before, you realize that in fact the so called cheap gas boiler is no longer cheap when you look at it over 20 years. And of course, it's cheap when you buy it as uh, the installation costs are quite uh, low. But you, when you compare it with the, the high-end HP plus solar technologies uh, system, uh, you, you realize that in fact, it's not that cheap because you have to buy gas 
all uh, every month for for 20 years and gas is not going to go cheaper it's going to go more expensive and uh, our by the way our hypothesis for those costs are based on official figures from the ADEM, the French National Agency for Energy uh, and Environment. So it's not our own figures, it's the official ones. Um, so next slide, please. Next slide, please. So uh, another uh, very classical indicator for comparing systems is the LCOE, so levelized cost of electricity. Consider you are uh, the global cost estimate for your, your system, you have your, the lifetime of your system, and you divide that by uh, so the number of kilowatt hours produced. You have a cost per kilowatt hours. Sometimes it's expressed per megawatt hours for large, uh, uh, you know, plants uh, connected to the electricity grid, for example. But in a home, I think it's more uh, obvious for for homeowners to to speak in kilowatt hours. So we compared everything. And you, as before, of course, you see that the traditional solutions that are very prevalent in Great Britain, for example, the gas boiler, but also in France, but also in many other countries in Europe, it's in fact as expensive as the high end uh, eight pump plus solar technologies uh, on the right. And if you add to those costs what uh, in French we call the social the social cost of carbon, or uh, which is an evaluation of the costs for society for the French society uh, in 2030, 40, 50, and so on of one ton of CO2, you realize that uh, you are really above uh, way above the uh, zero carbon technologies when you are installing either a gas boiler alone on the link on the left sorry or the gas boiler plus solar thermal stack which is more or less uh, the same cost uh, as the gas boiler alone uh, so it's uh, it's something that has to be uh, really considered because an energy service needs to be based on technologies that are both economically efficient and also have a general impact that is uh, positive um next slide please so uh let's get back to the energy service so the energy service as i said its goal is to avoid uh to the customers the two main pain points that i mentioned before that is initial investment and management in general of the energy system over its lifetime uh, let's consider a very practical case. It's a real house in Lorient. It's an it's individual home of 120 square meters. It's currently running an oil boiler, so very polluting, uh, 10, year old, 10 years old, uh, 1,500 euros of oil per year with a, a poor energy class, D. And let's consider that we change this system for something else. So next slide, please. We have two, push, two options. Either we remove the old boiler and we put a gas boiler, a traditional gas boiler. We call an installer, the installer come. Uh, we manage the, the, the works. We, we manage the, the boiler uh, uh, maintenance as, a, as the homeowner. We manage uh, repair when necessary and so on over 20 years. And we buy, of course, gas from the grid. Second hypothesis, we we uh, buy an energy service from an energy service company and this energy service is using a heat um, an air source heat pump and a solar heater uh, so very classical technologies nothing fancy there but what is innovative is the energy service next slide please so uh, we are of course subsidized by the French system. So as an individual homeowner for my gas boiler, I get some subsidy. I also get some subsidy as an ESCO uh, to install uh, my system. It's a different uh, subsidy system. All the prices I, I rely upon are uh, defined by the French national uh, agencies. So are, they are standardized prices. Uh, we have also integrated uh, some valuation of customer's time uh, when the customer is managing the, I would say, the, the installation, the looking for a repair uh, person and so on, but this is very marginal. 
added extra cost to that. Uh, it's just for the sake of, of completeness. We have also integrated, of course, preventive and curative maintenance costs. And we have followed the standard energy price scenarios as defined by the French National Agency for Energy. Next slide, please. So benefit is no initial investment. So currently the gas boiler customer buys a, a boiler. It's an install and ask someone to install it seven, 6,000 euros roughly. Viesco invests 15,000, but the customer doesn't see this. So as initial at T, T zero, if I may say the customers pay nothing with the energy service. Next slide, please. And then every month the customer pays something. So of course, in the gas boiler scenario, this is not the way it goes because the gas boiler uh, is not asking for a fee. Uh, the, there is the monthly gas bill. There is no fee from a repair guy. There is no. So we imagine where, that we sum up all the costs and divide it into 20 years. Every month you pay roughly 200 euros. On the contrary, with the energy service option, you pay only 175 roughly. So it's a minus 14% difference. So for us, this is this was a big, big uh, result because it means that having an energy service that makes the customer's life easier and the environment uh, happier is in fact less expensive than what the market currently considers the de facto solution. So this is very, very important. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Do you hear me? Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, no, previous slide, please. There is some delay in the slides. Thank you. So where does it come from, this diff price difference? Uh, it's very, very obvious that it comes from the same price difference as I presented at the beginning there is no fuel in fact there is of course a little electricity bill that is uh, integrated in the energy service cost there is of course an extra uh, at the installation of the energy system for the energy service and there is of course an extra cost that you can see at the very top on light green that is man the management of the energy service itself roughly three thousand euros but one in all when you sum it up it's still less expensive than the traditional market option with an installer, a repair guy after 10 years, and a, and a gas boiler with gas bill. Next slide, please. And if we wanted to, to consider the fact that the customer could be reluctant at signing, signing up for a 20 years contract, we could in fact go down that road and reduce the, the contract time by going to the crossing of the two curves, that's roughly 15 years in our model. But our opinion is that it's not necessarily the way to go. Uh, we want, in fact, an energy service that is uh, also focusing on trust, on a high quality relationship between an ESCO and a customer. And we want also to uh, uh, be sure that the customer at the very end of the, 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 the contract will have everything removed. So we integrate into the price of the service, the deinstallation costs, but we make that happen by going to the very end of the lifetime, all the, all the equipment. So it's also from a circular economic point of view, the vision that the ESCO is managing very high quality uh, equipment that is repairable, that is maintainable over a very long time. And this helps the ESCO make the, uh, the price go down. So it's also a very different way to see, I would say, the equipment market. Um, what I could say uh, also on this uh, is that we will, we do not rely in our model on what I would ca call the traditional commercial um, uh, group savings when you buy, for example, a lot of equipment at the same time and then we sell it to customers. We just consider public prices that 
could potentially uh, uh, really focus on specific equipment for a specific uh, building. So there is no reduction of price of the energy service through mass production or, or standardized service. So this is also very important for us because we want to be able to work with small manufacturers, local manufacturers of heat pumps, for example. Next slide, please. Uh, so, what is the impact for Lorient? Uh, so, Lorient has uh, an objective, a political objective, uh, following the Paris Agreement to go zero oil boiler uh, before 2030. That means uh, refurbishing 17,000 uh, homes. It's a lot. It's roughly three per day. Uh, I computed that. Uh, it's a lot. Uh, currently, uh, there is no real um, way to do that very efficiently using the classical market offering. Uh, so energy services, in fact, for us, could be a new lever for public stakeholders, either public companies, as we have in France, uh, gathering local authorities or social landlords and other type of stakeholders that can rely on, on the trust of the public and long term investment. But it will also have a very important benefit for homeowners that are currently poor and not able to invest upfront costs for switching to renewable energy. And also, we think that for local authorities, this kind of approach, the energy service, focusing on a very close uh, monitoring of everything, because to make that service happen and, and be successful, you have to monitor day to day what's going on. It will help also manage the energy system evolution at the territory scale. So uh, that's my presentation. I hope I didn't uh, went too slow. Uh, Dan, tell me if I have still time or not. I can still add a few things or if if it's uh, already over. I think Please it's I think it's already uh, a bit over time. Okay. But if you have any questions for David, again, he will uh, sit down at the virtual table. Just look. Thank you. You're very welcome, David. Always a pleasure having you here. And the yeah. next slide, Anna, please. So, um, thank you so much. Now the next slide. We're having, we're having a small delay on the slides, by the way. The presentation itself has about 200 megabytes. So it's taking a little bit of time to change the slides. Thank you so much. So it is my pleasure to introduce Barbara Breiskoff. Barbara is a senior researcher at Fraunhofer ESI in the field of energy policies and markets, with a special focus on socioeconomic questions of the energy transition. Project coordinator of several projects, among others, the project commissioned by the European Commission on uh, heating and cooling perception, markets, and regulatory framework. Prior to Fraunhofer ESI, um, she has professional experience in financing, development, and innovation <laughs> economics. Uh, and here she is. She was, <laughs> she was, she was uh, closing the window. <laughs> I was closing the window. Thank you very much, Dan, for your brief You're introduction. Very welcome. Very welcome. And uh, today, I, please, you can uh, go to the next slide. Uh, today, I'd like to present you some first results of our project, which we uh, commissioned by the European, Com uh, European Commission, and we do that in cooperation with four partners and H. Uh, EHBA is one of those partners, so please, next slide. Um, today, I'd like to briefly give an introduction, uh, overview of this project so that you understand a little bit more the conditions and the framework of that project. Then I'd like to present you the first results, the perception of factors governing decisions for heat pumps and district heating cooling. And second, uh, or the top, third top is uh, our second prim uh, primary results of a survey focusing on the perception of those technology in the industrial and in the public sector. So next slide, please. We start with an overview of the project. Here you see um, five ta uh, six tasks. Um, task one focuses on elements governing decisions. So what factors affect decision uh, making in uh, heating for heating services? Task two looks into the perception and the image of selected heating and cooling technology with a focus on district heating and on heat pumps. 
Task 5 takes the perspective of the consumers and uh, outlines some um, major cost components of district heating and cooling and heat pumps, while Task 3 takes the perspective of the supplier or more from the supply side, looking into incentives and regulations driving the use of efficient energy efficient technologies and renewable energy technologies. It also looks at different costs connected with district heating and cooling. And task five is a little bit different because it looks at the instrument, namely the energy efficiency obligation schemes, and we should identify elements that allow maybe a trade of those uh, scheme uh, within the scheme, so allow uh, using certificates which can be traded then. And of course, um, task six is a very important one as well, and H EHPA is responsible for that, is the presentation dissemination of the results. So let's start with the first topic, so please next slide. So we start with the factors and the perceptions. And please, next slide there, we have the objective of this first task has been to identify elements that influence the decision making and the implementation of low carbon heating and cooling options. And we have a special focus on renewable energy and energy efficient technologies. And we do that, or we look especially at the residential, the industrial and the public sector. What is our approach? We do a literature research or meta-analysis. We set up a literature database where we focus, of course, on those district heating, cooling and uh, heat pump technologies, but we include a lot of information in that database on the technologies that are looked at, on the sectors and actors, on drivers and barriers, on geographic coverage and methods applied to identify, for example, drivers and barriers. Overall, we collected about 130 studies and focused especially on those that had the interface between the respective technologies, actors and drivers we, we are focusing on. Next slide, please. There is a report available on this first result, so that's a literature review, and you can find it under this given link here above. And I'd like to give you a brief outline of the results we, or uh, findings from this literature review. And uh, to do that review, to cluster our findings, we use this framework, which is depicted here in that slide. It distinguished between three levels, the macro level, which focuses more on aspects that are not directly related to the energy system, but more at the global level, global market, global development, overarching short-term or long-term issues that might be somehow connected to the energy system, but not directly. Then the MESA level, there's that's the energy system level where we look at the energy system, but also at the environment close, uh, that is closely or around the respective actors uh, we are looking at. And finally, we in, uh, look at the micro level, and this is more at individual constraints or preferences, opportunities, or also strategies from a business perspective or maybe also enabling factors for community. Um, we also differentiate between the three different types or act actor types or sectors. We look at individuals, namely households or citizens, then at industry and then at the public sector. And when you go to the next slide, please, we see the first, or we uh, have collected here the first uh, results or the primary results affecting heat pumps uh, decisions in the residential sector and not surprisingly of course we see that energy prices or investment costs in that case play a role but also environmental issues such as local pollution awareness of the climate change etc are well factors that have an 
affect on the uh, influencer decisions. But of course, there are also technical issues and socio-democratic issues like available income that have some that act as or exert some restrictions on the on the decision. So, if the technical specifications do not fit to a certain technology or bill of the building or does not fit to the technology, then there's no way to to apply that carbon free or low carbon technology. And of course, we also identified individual features and behavior aspects like the need for a certain level of comfort, for convenience, for supply security or risk aversion. Um, there's also kind of uh, bias, a present bias that we don't like to have change, etc. Though these are also factors at the individual level that really affect the decisions. At a meso level, we identified in literature mainly the impact of technology providers and installers, uh, service providers, but also the recommendations of, um, of friends, of peers. I don't see any more slides. Do you have a problem? Yes, yes. I think the uh, I think my colleague's computer just went offline. Okay. So if you'll just give me one second, I'll just share the screen myself. Yes. Um, of course, you'll have to tell me this, the exact slide. Yes, but I can continue talking because these are just the factors we're talking and I can easily be read afterwards again on the slides. So when you go to, go to slide seven, then, then it's fine. I continue with those factors at a macro level that influ has an influence on the citizen. There, the social acceptance and the practices all around you and the regulations are important. Um, when we look at uh, factors that have impacts on the decision in the industrial sector and the public sector, we also see that economics play a role, especially in the industrial sector. Um, it's even crucial because it need, they have uh, they have profit as their objective, so they should uh, decide for profitable solutions. But also technical issues determine somehow the, uh, the use of certain technologies. Um, market aspects also play a role. Then uh, some slides back, I think uh, two slides back, please. Another one? Yeah, thanks. That's exactly perfect. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, internal, the internal management, but also market aspects might play a role in the industrial sector. At a meso level, again, the technical infrastructure, re available resources, and energy market conditions at the local area more, regular issues and the customer focus are important as well. Um, the macro level is similar as, that, uh, as for the individual level, uh, at the indi for the individual, so the market conditions, the standards and regulations play a role. The public sector um, is similar in the sense that they, are, they depend much more on regulations. They are forced or they are obliged to fulfill certain efficiency standards, but they also have to decide for the low, least cost solutions. So there are also kind of economic issues that determine the selection, but also the expertise or the experience of those persons in charge of the heating cooling system is crucial. And then also the technical and economic factors in the community the uncertainty they are facing the, uh, the, the, the public entities with respect, for example, to energy prices might also be a factor that makes them hesitating for deciding for a more risky solution, price risky solution. At a mesa level, the energy supply, security, infrastructure, and resources and regulations play a role. Um, at a macro level, again, the social equity and environmental issues uh, more in the center than, for example, at the industrial sector. So this has been the results from uh, in, uh, the literature review. And now please, next slide. I'd like to briefly present you some results of the survey. 
and uh, we conducted that survey in the industrial sector and the public sector. The objective was to see and to understand how people in the industrial and public sector perceive heat pumps and district heating and cooling. The approach we chose was a brief uh, online survey with five questions. And here you see this uh, link for this survey. And it's also posted in the chat. Thanks, Anna. That's my colleague we, you, who uh, contributed a lot uh, uh, to this task. And we are happy if you forward this share to persons, to your network, you know, such that more companies can uh, participate in this survey or more public entities can participate there so that we collect no, even more answers than we have already gotten. The focus of this survey, and it's really a brief survey, is uh, on, I call it statistical data. We are asking for the country, the size of the company, or the sector they're in, uh, energy consumption, the current heating system they have, and then of course our perception questions. And this, uh, in total, these are five questions. Uh, we have contacted more than 10,000 firms or service providers in the industrial and public sector. And we got about, about 100 respondents of comprising 19 uh, countries in Europe. But there's a strong bias towards Germany, UK and Austria. So if you know other countries or actors, stakeholders in other countries in the industrial and the public sector. We would be very happy if you could share this link. So next slide, please. I'd like to show you briefly the, the, uh, the current heating system that the respondents have uh, are using. So we got uh, on the left side, the respondents from the industry and the service sector about 66. And on the left side, the respondents of the public sector, which are comprised of public administration, education, social and health services. We only got 10 respondents there. So could be the number could be better. We would be happy if the sample would show or get a higher uh, participating participate rate. Um, here you see in the industrial sector that the majority uses still fossil fuel boilers, while in the public sector, well, a low number, but at the moment we see that that's much more diverse and the district heating cooling sector, well, is, um, is dominating. But again, this is not a representative sample um, and the numbers are still very low. So please, next slide. Um, we ask uh, uh, for different technologies. We ask them to give their uh, perception uh, with, uh, of fossil fuel boilers, biomass boilers, solar thermal, district heating, heat pumps, and combined heat and power plants. And we ask them to assess how climate friendly or how reliable those technologies technologies are, how the costs of heat are, are how risky they are, or how much they are exposed or feel exposed to price risk or price volatility, and how strongly they think they depend on a certain supplier. And here I've depicted the results with the focus on heat pumps. We can see that heat pumps are considered as very climate friendly as a low price risk technology and as a, a low uh, a technology that, that entails a low dependency on an energy supplier or technology provider. While with respect to re reliability, heat pumps are not that bad, but they're, they are ranked third. And with respect to cost of heat, they share the second uh, rank together with two other technologies, namely solar thermal and district heating. Next slide, please. Here you can see a, a comparison between the respondents that are non-users of heat, heat pumps. And on the right side, you see the answers of respondents that are users of heat pumps. Again, the number of, of participants per sample, like subsample here, it's low, but still we get some, uh, some uh, we get an idea of how the perception is, 
And overall, the perception between non-users and users is rather, rather similar, except for the dependency. Their heat pump users realize that they um, better realize or even more realize that here the dependency on a supplier uh, of fuel or of heat or of technology is very low. This is really the strength of heat pump here also. And uh, the other perceptions like low price risk, low cost for heat or climate friendly, the pattern is pretty similar. So let's come to the next slide. Then I'd like to give a brief summary. And yeah, you're right here. Um, the factors affecting decision making of uh, households or citizens in the industry and in the public sector are outlined. But uh, we see that the major factor or a positive aspect of heat pumps is that there's no dependency on the supplier but maybe a challenge in understanding the technology because it is not that common and it seems to be less, uh, people seem to be less uh, acquainted with that technology and there's still a need to promote it a little bit. In general, we notice that the long-term commitment of policymakers with respect to the technology to heat pumps is important, namely with respect to how how strong will be the efficiency requirements and the emission requirements of buildings in future. Then also the institutional framework where pricing rules is important. For example, this repeating, the pricing rules play a huge role while for heat pumps, as they, de as they depend on, on electricity, there are uh, very transparent rules. They are already met or there's no need to improve them. And finally, values and attitudes of the different people, especially the households, play a large, uh, a huge role as well. Regarding the perception of heat pump, regarding the perceptions of heat pumps, we see that they are considered as climate friendly, low cost, and low price risk, and low dependency with on suppliers. But we what we missed overall is that. Uh, especially in literature, there has been hardly any reference to the contribution of heat pumps to the flexibility of the system and it's combined with digital tools or solutions. And this is some aspect I think should be further, uh, should be included in future information and dissemination activities that heat pumps entail or uh, support or uh, enable the system to be more flexible and this is a, and that this is a benefit for the system but also maybe for the single user at their, as they can react to pricing schemes or to pricing signals in that case and these are our findings our preliminary findings the next slide that's the last slide i say thank you very much and in case you have any questions please feel free and let me know or share them with me. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting to, to speak about the perceptions. Uh, <laughs> I lost my words. We're sharing so many screens and toggling all this software, I'm, I'm losing the, the capacity to express myself. But no matter, as I only introduce the speakers. So that's very, very good for me. Uh, thank you again, Barbara. Uh, very interesting studies, and these studies will actually inform the European Commission as well as member states. So very, very um, nice, and very, uh, we are very honored to be to be part of it. Uh, and very good pointing out the digital solutions and flexibilities because our next next speaker, Atsim, will talk a little bit about that. But in the meantime, I would like to introduce you to Julian Tavernier, sales engineer at EcoForest, um, working for EcoForest for quite a long time. Um, he will talk about the different products that EcoForest has, and um, most of them, well, almost all of them are designed and, um, and manufactured and deployed using the strategic research and innovation um, agenda that we have. So modular, easy to install, to install and so on. He works for EcoForest 
as this gives him an opportunity, I will quote him here, although I don't have the quote, so I will paraphrase, gives him an opportunity to work in a field that is very much uh, attuned to his passion, that is of mitigating the great threat of climate change that we are facing. So, Julian, hope you uh, you uh, will excuse my, uh, you know, my little bit of uh, improvisation here, as I cannot see your bio anymore on my screens. And the virtual floor, virtual microphone is yours. Tell my colleague, well, tell my colleague, I'm, now it's me that I changed the slides. So, please. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dan, and for the invitation. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I will be then presenting to you this um, design and installation of your new generation heat pumps presentation. Uh, we can go to the to the next slide uh, we, and to the next also. Uh, and um, I will divide this presentation in four main blocks. Okay, for the neophytes or those who don't, may uh, don't know Ecoforest, I will first um, uh, make a little introduction of the company to all of you and then uh, present uh, three different uh, development lines and product uh, lines we have been working on and that are available today um, regarding the scope of uh, the new generation uh, HVAC systems, okay? So let's start uh, by the beginning, as we say. Um, let's talk about this company, Ecoforest. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, which has been founded in 1959, so quite uh, a long time ago, 60 years, um, uh, which has all, always had this um, engagement with the environment uh, in its uh, working philosophy, which is quite, quite important in this sector. Um, uh, also mixing this with an innovation component, which is um, also needed uh, in this heat pump uh, market that we work on. So uh, Ecoforce has been a technological leader in several uh, sectors since its uh, creation. First of all, in the biomass sector, uh, pellet and biomass uh, boilers and stoves, uh, and then uh, got into the heat pump market, um, also developing since the beginning um, innovative products uh, like its first heat pump, which was already in 2011, an inverter, water-to-water, -water, uh, reversible um, scroll unit. So um, this um, is can be used as an example of the of the development line of the company, uh, which keeps this way and still uh, push it, positions itself in the in the in the innovation side. Of the sector. So nowadays, the activity of the company still uh, includes the biomass sector, in which Ecoforce is also a, a leader on the market in the European market, um, as well as the heat pump sector and the renewable hybrid systems. Uh, we will talk about this uh, later. Um, regarding the company, nowadays, now speaking only about the heat pump uh, market, uh, is already present in more than 40 countries today. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Um, well, in here you have a brief slide presenting just for those who doesn't know the company, the current product range uh, in the heat pump uh, sector of Ecoforest. Okay, so we divide this product range in two main groups. Okay, uh, brain to water heat pumps and water air to water heat pumps. Um, destined for residential uh, and also industrial applications, okay? Um, all of the heat pumps that Ecoforest manufactures in, in Europe and Spain um, are inverter technology, okay? There's no uh, on-off products within the Ecoforest product range. Um, this may serve as also as a, a sign of the innovative uh, development line of the company. Um, and, uh, under each one of the of the product ranges, which are EcoGeo Plus Basic and Compact, EcoGeo Plus uh, HP High Power and EcoAir Plus, you will see different um, uh, modulation ranges uh, represented. These are the modulation ranges of each one of the products included in each one of the ranges. So uh, you may see 
huge modulation ranges uh, in general with scroll technology, single step modulation, like for example, the EcoGeo uh, HP modules, um, 12 to 40 kilowatt, 15 to, 1 to 70, or 25 to 100 kilowatt modulation range, okay? Um, and these units are been made to uh, respond to the needs of the of the HVAC sector nowadays, which are of course domestic hot water production, but also heating, cooling, and uh, well regarding the brine to water heat pumps, we divide this cooling application in uh, active cooling reversible units and passive cooling. Okay, so also known as free cooling. Um, we can go to the next slide. And we will enter one of these um, of these development lines uh, we have been working on uh, for a while in the last years, and that is uh, reality nowadays, which are the R two hundred ninety heat pump generation. Okay, um, we can go to the next slide. Um, propane. Um, Many of you may know about these uh, these uh, refrigerant or this the this natural refrigerant um, is probably the the best fit natural solution for the heat pump market. Okay, uh, as you may know, the GWP, the global warming potential of this refrigerant, um, uh, is only three. Okay, really similar to CO two and. Um, this disrupts with the tendency of the market. Um, just to make a comparison, uh, the most uh, common heat pumps nowadays use uh, R410A, uh, which present a GWP of 2088. Okay, so barely 700 times more than propane. Um, and nowadays, there's a tendency of uh, using a new refrigerants to avoid as the uh, regulations ask for it, the R410A, and we are moving to uh, refrigerants like uh, R452B, R32, R407C. Um, these refrigerants uh, um, are present lower GWPs than, of course, R410A, but transition refrigerants towards the next generation, which will be the natural refrigerant uh, generation. And in this case, um, we can ask ourselves why we didn't go directly to this uh, natural refrigerant generation of heat pumps, which we could, because technologically, we can use these uh, refrigerants. Uh, then why won't we go directly there? Uh, there's a main point with, for example, propane, which is the flammability of the refrigerant, okay? Which is something the regulations nowadays are, are um, reviewing and trying to uh, maybe adapt to the current needs of the market. Um, and it's something can be uh, taken into account into the design and the, and the conception of the heat pump itself. Uh, and that we have done in these uh, models that we'll be presenting you in the next slides. So uh, the best, uh, probably one of the best um, points uh, regarding propane is the it's well fit in thermodynamic properties. Okay, uh, below in this slide, left side, you can see two diagrams which represent the operational chart uh, of the of one air to water units. Uh, using propane as a refrigerant um, compared uh, that we we can't compare to another uh, current refrigerant in the market um, and uh, you can see in there uh, refrigerant allows us to produce uh, up to 70 degrees uh, minus 10 degrees outside which is something uh, we can reach with our refrigerants and we would be even uh, reaching those values needing uh, the EVI systems, which mean more expensive units, uh, to 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 reach in other in other cases. So propane presents both the performance and the low emissions associated, uh, which allow us to say it's a good solution for the future. Um, uh, we can go to the next slide. So in here we have this first. Um, 
product range, which is the Eco Air Plus Pro. Um, this is a whole uh, propane range of uh, air to water monobulk units, of course, always inverter technology, um, destined to the uh, residential uh, applications. Okay, so uh, we can we can talk about heating, domestic hot water cooling, and pool services in models that present ranges of modulation uh, from one to seven, one to nine, and three to twelve. Uh, and having the main features of, of the propane as a refrigerant, so allowing a uh, 60 degrees out of the temperature, minus 20 degrees outside without EVI systems, um, uh, and also for cooling, allowing us to produce 7 degrees cooling temperature at um, 50 degrees outside, which is uh, now that is growing as a need, the cooling service. We can go to the next slide in which we will be um, having an example of the application of this Equal Plus Pro unit. Okay. Um, uh, regarding this uh, propane refrigerant uh, application in air to water units, monoblock air to water units, there's no further limitation than the uh, units itself to be able uh, to diffuse, to extract uh, the 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 refrigerant in case in case of a loss so there's no major limitation regarding the dimensioning of these units um, in this example you see for example a 3 to 12 unit uh, used uh, in a single dwelling for domestic hot water heating in radiators application and cooling with uh, fan coils cooling um, the scheme you see uh, below represent the outdoor unit I had a hydraulic uh, indoor unit, which includes the domestic hot water tank, plus the recirculation control, and the heating system with a little tank, uh, 100 liters, and uh, a two zones control, all done by the heat pump regulation uh, of the heating and the cooling systems. Um, the SPF, what we call the seasonal performance factor of this unit uh, along the last year is four, which is quite high regarding the radiators application uh, in, in Europe. So uh, propane offers us the possibility to um, use heat pumps in retrofit installations with old, um, uh, old radiators and, uh, and uh, the, the replacement of boilers is possible thanks to these uh, new refrigerant uh, heat pumps. We can go now to the next slide. And I will be now presenting you a premiere, we can say, in the heat pump uh, market, which is this EcoGeo Plus Pro. Okay, the EcoGeo Plus Pro is a brine to water unit. Uh, doesn't mandatorily mean it is a ground source unit. We'll see later why. Um, uh, that can modulate from one to six kilowatt, even up to seven in some conditions. Um, and that includes the, the applications of domestic hot water heating, cooling, and pool services. Um, and which is main feature, it is uh, is that uh, it is a propane unit that doesn't need uh, to take into account any specific uh, technical room restriction uh, to be installed indoors. Okay, uh, why is this possible? As I said before, propane uh, presents some restrictions indoors um, and sometimes ventilation systems are needed and volume dimensions are, are required. Um, it is not the case in, uh, with this heat pump. Why? The refrigerant load of these one to six kilowatt unit is only 150 grams, okay, which is under the minimum requirements uh in the current regulation uh to apply restrictions to the technical rooms so we could be having a, a brain to water unit indoor with propane nowadays uh for any kind of application we'll see later another application but in the next slide uh, we'll see the classic one so next slide please so a uh, new building single dwelling uh passive house uh, little, little uh, thermal demands, so mainly uh, heating domestic water and cooling, which is now required in, in, in all our, along Europe, um, with a really compact installation, uh, 
um, in this case, an EcoGeo Plus compact uh, unit, okay, which includes the domestic hot water tank. No buffer tanks needed as the modulation range of the unit is quite, quite big. Uh, in this case, we produce domestic hot water, heating and cooling with underfloor heating, cooling, um, and pool service, okay. Um, the seasonal performance factor of this unit, which has been running for uh, already one year, is 5.5, okay. Um, and in this case, this ground source system uh, requires only one vertical loop, one single borehole of 70 meters depth. So in this case, this ground source uh, solution becomes also a really um, economic uh, solution, okay, compared to uh, even air to water systems in many cases. Okay, so ground source can be a solution for the future, even using this kind of units, like uh, these EcoGeo Plus Pro, uh, Pro Pen units. Okay, and having all the advantages of the natural refrigerant and the, 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 the efficiencies that the Pro Pen presents. Now we can go to the next slide. And I will be presenting you of the development lines of EcoForest nowadays. Uh, which has been uh, like this for for a while now, um, and it's and it's quite interesting. I saw my colleague uh, David Bourguignon um, talk about the uh, heat pump combined with solar thermal energy. I will be now and and PV also, uh, and I will be now speaking in detail about this uh, possible PV and heat pump combination with our technology. So we can go uh, for the next slide. As you may know. One of the main problems of PV now, which is uh, now rarely paid by the governments and subventions, is um, that consumption periods doesn't, don't match um, uh, uh, PV production periods, okay? So, uh, in general, storage is needed in these installations. We can go to the next slide. And uh, this is the approach of EcoForest in that sense. Uh, we know mainly the, the storage uh, or the most common storage used is batteries, electrical batteries. But electrical batteries present some problems nowadays with the current technology, which are the costs and the lack of efficiency in the long and medium term. So um, this makes uh, installations unprofitable indeed. Um, so we thought about using the heat pump as a vector to make this energy storage when we have our PV production available. Um, uh, and the, the situation is quite simple. What if we use a buffer tank or a domestic hot water tank or a pool as a storage system as the heat pump is connected to it and we can, and we can heat or cool them? Um, so we made a simple estimation uh, or we may represent this by a simple estimation, which you see in the uh, left side of your screens. Let's speak about a 500 liters tank, which is quite common nowadays. Um, and let's imagine we have a standard heating set point, set point in this tank of 40 degrees. What if we and heat it up to 60? Well, we will be stocking, we would be stocking about 11.6 kilowatt hour. If we think about the cost of a electrical battery system uh, matching these 11.6 kilowatt hour capacity, um, uh, we'll be, we would be speaking about a lot of money and that would be need to be replaced in about 10 years, okay? Um, so uh, thermal storage, can be a great solution with, for PV applications. In fact, thermal needs represent about 60, 70% of the thermal needs of a building nowadays. So why not using this system to, to these thermal systems to store the PV production? And we developed this uh, need zero balance management for our heat pumps. Uh, below on the, on the left side, you see a graph um, representing a, the working uh, period of one day of one heat pump in an installation in Germany, okay, in October last, uh, in 2018, um, in which the purple line represents the consumption of the heat pump in kilowatt, 
and the red line uh, represents the PV production the PV production during the day. The green line uh, that you see below represents the energy consumption from the grid of the building of the whole building in a day. Um, the blue line represents the temperature of the storage tank we used in this test. So as you can see, the purple line, the consumption of the heat pump, uh, as the heat pump can modulate, as we said before, all the eco-forest heat pumps are inverter technology with large modulation ranges, adapts its modulation, adapts its consumption to never exceed the pre-V production available. So we uh, only store for free the available PV energy into uh, thermal energy in our tank. Okay. Uh, the result is that the maximum uh, consumption peak of the house during the day is only two kilowatt, a two hundred meter house, two hundred square meter house. Okay. So let's see an example. We can go for the next slide. This is a system working um, for also a single dwelling, okay, uh, 220 meet, square meters uh, with domestic hot water heating and cooling needs, okay. We selected the data only for the, um, the available months that we have uh, re registered them. So uh, from October last year up to May this year, so the heating period of the year, we can say. Um, uh, and uh, left side, you have the installation scheme. Uh, so uh, with the rectang rectangle uh, on top side, you see the PV part of the installation, which only requires a um, energy meter to be connected to the heat pump to make the system run. Okay, the control strategies do not require any external module, uh, any control module to be added to the installation. All is integrated in the heat pump control strategies by default. Okay, and this heat pump, which is an EcoGeo Plus one to nine unit, works as a air source unit. Okay, work as as, a, as an air source system using a uh, dry cooler, which we call AU12, uh, as collection system. Okay, so it's still a monoblock, we can say, uh, brain to water unit, but taking the energy uh, from the air. Okay, so the heat pump remains in the inside of the building, but we take our energy from an air system, okay, uh, with lower refrigerant loads and better lifespans of the unit. So, uh, quite an interesting solution, which has other advantages. I'm not talking about today, but if someone is interested, we can we can speak about this later. So um, uh, these the results of the application of this system were a um, seasonal performance factor of 4.5 during the, this period analyzed um, uh, for the system, and 33% of the total consumption of the heat pump was done in a surplus condition. So 33% at least of the energy cons consumed by the heat pump was totally provided by the PV system, which is a lot, okay, which is a great um, uh, reduction of the consumption of, of, the, of the building and um, with no additional cost to the installation. So quite an interesting system. We can go to the next slide. So now uh, the last of these um, development lines and products we have available um, uh, I'm speaking about is the uh, solution for the residential buildings, okay, which is also one of the... Sorry yeah. to disturb you, Julian. Um, just a reminder that um, we are kind of running out of time. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> sorry about Okay, <laughs> two minutes and I'm done. Thank you, then. Um, so... Uh, this um, residential building situation is one also of the main aspects that we have to face in the following years. How are we uh, retrofitting or re uh, renovating these, these buildings to be efficient uh, uh, in the future? So, next slide. We uh, have two solutions available in that sense which are the centralized systems, which are perfect in the boiler replacement and retrofit for the installations, okay? So, um, uh, main technical rooms that, we, that would um, 
uh, feed the energy to the main system as boilers did in the past, but advantage, with, with the advantage of uh, domestic hot water heating and cooling possible applications. Um, easy to, to, to implement as we can directly replace the boiler and uh, in the technical room and use the, um, the existing installation uh, to, to be providing the services to the, to the system. We can make this work in ground source, uh, source hybrid collection systems. This is possible today with, uh, with the, what we call the EcoSmart eSource system combined to these heat pumps. Still, um, still brine to water units, okay? Uh, and we can go to the next slide. And we have this second option, which is the decentralized system, um, in which we will would be using, we are using um, uh, individual installations for each one of the of the apartments, which is probably most uh, applicable to new buildings. Okay, so we can uh, have individual installations with individual individual consumptions. So really uh, much more easy to manage regarding uh, efficiencies and um, and uh, the control of the consumption uh, of the installations uh, and that would be using common um, collection systems we can have ground source air source with a common single unit to be feeding the energy to the whole building uh, or even hybrid systems so this is uh this makes it possible to be working and this is the last point of this speech uh i promise um, um having propane units indoor installed for residential buildings with its advantages natural refrigerant uh low refrigerant refrigerant uh, loads um and great performances in ground source or air source for energy communities we can which can also take profit of the pv thanks to the uh pv hybridization that they allow to to be done so uh this all we can go to the last slide which is the thank you slide so thank you everyone for the attention sorry if i run out of time um hope this has been clear thank thanks for for the invitation to the hpa and I, I give you back the words, uh, Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. Um, it's okay. We have we had a question and answers uh, section, but again, you can just speak with the speakers live at one of the tables. So, and again, I must apologize because I share all the screens. Um, I cannot read the bios that I had for the speakers. Uh, but it is my pleasure to introduce you to Atsin Madrid, Product Manager at Equavat. And she'll talk about the digital solutions, the role of algorithms and software in heating and cooling. Uh, we had her before, and it's a pleasure to welcome her again. So, Atsin, the floor is yours. Just tell me when to move the slides. And hopefully Thank the you, microphone and camera work. They work fine. Yeah, they're working fine, right? Thank you very much. Uh, and yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's really good to be participating in this panel again and well again like last time in such a relevant area and uh, especially in this you know unprecedented and complex times we're living but uh, we have the opportunity to embrace positive collective change and the technology to accelerate that much needed transition um so yeah uh, next uh, the first slide please so i'll be Um, oh, oh, I think, yeah, I think I was lost for a second there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So today I'll be talking about uh, machine learning and uh, data science work for smart heating that Equiwat um, is, is developing and that's enabling us to revolutionize the way homes collectively use energy through digital technology. Um, so I'd like to start by um by telling you a bit about equiwatt and you know what it is what we do and and how we do it um so uh, equiwatt is a clean technology company that's that's been pioneering residential demand side response um for those of, of you who are not uh, very familiar with the with the term or residential demand side response is 
simply the method of reducing energy use at peak times so that there's less um, of a strain uh, on the national grid or our local levels. And it's also viewed as an energy service. Um, so essentially it's the regulation of consumer uh, energy demand patterns. And we've been developing a smart energy platform building a community-led virtual power plant, uh, which I will speak about it more um, in, the, in the later slides. And uh, yeah, in a nutshell, we've been helping households across the UK to use energy more intelligently and more efficiently for nearly two years now. Um, that's two years, which, which uh, is the time our solution has been out there in the market, available um, to anyone in the UK. Um, it is an app. And you know, before that, there's been a, a few years of, of trials, beta testing, and a lot of research and development. Um, can, can you still hear me? I'm not sure if I, if connection's still right. Hello? Okay. Is, 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 I'm still connected. I have not lost connection. No, no, you're quite oh, okay. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, good to know. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the, I mean, the traction that we've had is that we have now um, a, a good base of active participants um, with their home appliances and devices connected to our virtual power plant. And uh, we are currently uh, trialing our EV smart charging solution and taking part in our heat pump pilot project that is part of our uh, smart heating service development. Now, um, how this, uh, how um, going more into how our energy platform works, and uh, it, it's basically uh, we are enabled by IoT, and again for. Uh, those who are not that familiar with the term because you know there are all of these buzzwords but IoT is the ability to remotely control and manage domestic appliances by electronically controlled and internet enabled um, uh, connected systems and it, the, the proposition is that users uh, download and sign up to our app which is a very friendly simple and engaging app uh, and they connect their appliances and set their preferences to participate in our energy saving events, which we call equi events, um, in which we temporarily switch off appliances and devices connected at peak times or based in different signals like energy prices or, or carbon intensity. And users are points every time they participate. And this is all enabled by our AI cloud software, which, you know, um, it in the end delivers an aggregated domestic loads from fridger, fridges to washing machines to heaters, heat pumps, EVs, um, and that provide the support and flexibility uh, service to the network. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, while the heat pump uh, mass adoption we know is uh, not as as going as fast as you know as it should be and it's still a challenge because of people's perceptions and upfront costs and and etc but because of you know some uh, some events like price drop policy incentives and more environmental awareness the number of heat pumps in you know in, in Europe in general but in British homes is forecasted to significantly grow in upcoming years. Um, and just to illustrate this here, I've put a, a couple of examples. Well, um, UK PN uh, reports of future scenarios has forecasted that alone only in the area they operate in London, the East and Southeast, uh, it is expected to grow from uh, to or to have 700,000 electric heat pumps by 2030. And um, in the in the central southern England and uh, the north of Scotland, where SSE operates, heat pumps is expected to grow uh, from 32,000 to over 2.47 million. So that's considerable uh, uptake. And um, and yeah, this uh, is. Uh, gives an example or a good idea of how accelerated electrification in the UK system is expected to be and the challenges uh, it will cause a disruption for the electricity networks and how to transition to net zero but do it in a secure and cost-effective manner and all, on the other hand the consumer engagement challenge and how to effectively encourage behavioral change and that residents adopt low carbon technologies but not only that that they use energy smarter and in a more efficient way and that's why solutions such as equiwatt with 
uh, IoT and machine learning are at the core, um, at their core, so relevant. Um, they're enabling uh, the automation and you know monitoring and controlling of HVAC systems, amongst other devices and appliances, minimizing the unnecessary energy consumption um, and matching the times of greener and cheaper electricity. And you know why is it so important? You know it may be obvious, but you know everyone wants to come home to a warm and cozy home after a long day and especially in the colder months but you know some central heatings can deliver this so they end up leaving their heating all day or you know in the case of heat pumps if they're not efficiently operated if we time that by the millions of of, of you know of, of uh, heat pumps and electric heaters that there will be that's definitely a, a, a challenge and a burden to the system uh, next slide please so uh Unlocking the flexibility from these appliances and devices requires a lot of knowledge, uh, which in part depends on modeling uh, the household and the, the residents' activities, the events, you know, local and global, like now the Olympics is a good example, and especially more uh, toward the finals where, you know, there's more uh, viewers at the same time. The weather have an effect on appliance usage. So understanding these relationships is why we are using AI and, and data science. Um, so these uh, fleets of IoT devices, or what we call our, our virtual power plant, present an opportunity to leverage their flexibility for the benefit of the grid and climate, and they're lending their flexibility to offset the peaks that they <laughs> that they cause themselves. Uh, but to um, to you know, and the other expensive events they create, and home appliances and devices uh, are, are aggregated and create a virtual power plant. So our use of machine learning enables us to do more with less and, and to, to deliver, to unlock that flexibility. Now, Equiwatt Smart Scheduling for Energy Saving Events, what I've mentioned before, our Equivents allows everybody to, to benefit from uh, cost, uh, energy and reductions in the energy bill and, and reducing carbon footprint. Um, so we're developing this smart software that forecasts or aims to forecast accurately household energy demand and flexibility from those home appliances and it provides insights on how to best time the household energy use that is synchronized with energy you know how to how to best synchronize the energy use which is the demand with times of cleaner generation and decreasing the times of dirtier energy so those signals would affect you uh, would uh, like um, ultimately uh, go or be action through our through our smart app that um, would you know automatically turn off uh, appliance and devices when energy is most expensive, more carbon intensive, or causing stress in the network. But not only that, on the contrary as well, to be able to absorb that renewable oh. energy when it's avoid, uh, abundant and and avoid curtailment, which you know is when uh, wind farms or solar are are limited or they need to reduce their output because there is not enough demand. Uh, the next one, please. And I think she has problems with her internet as um, she has logged out again. Fortunately. Hello. Um, I think, Atsim, you have to um, turn off the camera because sure. your internet is going um, on and off. Sure. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, please let me know if, if you know if you can if I get stuck or something again. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so just to point out that um, a lot of this work um, in AI and data science has been done through a research partnership with Newcastle University uh, for researching, testing, and validating on AI software for smart grid applications. You know, our research AI lead Joe has done a huge amount of this of this work, and um, and and this is um, to illustrate this previously explained as a practical application of AI for smart grids. Um, we uh, Equiwatt was part of a of a case study uh, on a project called Ep OpenLV for a, a distribution network operator, uh, Western Power Distribution. And uh, the 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 aim of this project was to develop the algorithms for demand side response events at the distribution level based on real electricity data. So it consisted on translating local electricity data from low voltage substations into signals that send actionable responses to our connected domestic loads, like heat pumps, like electric heaters. 
and that uh, essentially helped uh, us and the DNO to better understand energy demand profile and behavior uh, and to explore the impact of energy demand reduction as a constraint management tool, uh, which would in effectively enable us to unlock domestic demand sorry, response via our app. Uh, next slide, please. Now, in the specific case of, of, of our heating solution and the heat pump uh, trials that we're doing, uh, and for you to have a better understanding of the architecture, I mean, the concept is still the same. It's a, it's a home appliance or device. And we basically will be rewarding users for smart charging their homes and saving energy at peak time. Uh, the heat pump is connected to a smart thermostat and then it's digitally enabled and integrated to our digital platform, allowing the interoperability between devices, uh, which allows, you know, its smart management and to be smart grid ready and to respond to our uh, residential demands at response signals, um, which are our equipments. events. And we have these core elements uh, of automation, uh, of comfort and of control for users. Um, so, as an example, we can take that, um, we can forecast the peak hours or the times uh, where there's going to be some local grid constraints, say, for instance, on Tuesday at 11 a.m. because of different reasons, uh, cold weather or, you know, something like that. And then um, we would match or try to match the preheat uh, uh, users' homes so it reaches a comfort temperature and it maintains so it doesn't go or it doesn't drop down the max drop uh, preference of the users and during the equi event in which we would switch them um, off along with other appliances and devices. Uh, so next slide please. So in order to successfully deploy this solution and unlocking heat pumps as an asset uh, for the for the grid and for the energy systems of the future and also so households can benefit from it, it requires a lot of research and knowledge in which we are also applying um, we are developing the algorithms and evaluating um, evaluating them to deploy this DSR um, domestic heat pump while while we ensure an optimal level of comfort for residents, which is one of the most challenging bits. Um, to, we're also exploring the impact of energy demand reduction in areas where there is an estimated increase of electric heating and network constraints. And one of the most important things is to to understand the end user behavior um, and research uh, how heat pump operation uh, can enable flexibility for, for peak shifting, but how the impact of end user behavior uh, affects, affect, would affect these uh, patterns. Um, some, to put some examples, like how rewarding uh, users uh, for energy wise behaviors or what influence can uh, price signals or time of use tariffs could have in that. Um, and then also some other some other things like you know the rebound effect and some other considerations that need to be there. And essentially, this trial is to and and this and this um, solution is to see effectively how much flexibility can heat pumps provide with real life circumstances. Um, and you know now now um, the the with with the pandemic we see a lot of. Um, the, uh, shifts in, in, in consumption and peak hours. So that's going to be definitely really important for, for the future. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd normally just like, and we normally like uh, wrapping up with a highlighting, stressing the fact that this solution has already shown and proved its techno-economical um, feasibility. And, and there's um, many, many trials and many solutions being deployed there, which you know ultimately are uh, to benefit everyone from network operators and being able to, to save uh, in millions of pounds in infrastructure and operational costs or avoid uh, reinforcements in the grid. Um, and then for households and then consumers to, to use energy uh, more efficiently to participate in energy tariffs and to be more aware of their consumption. And projects like this can definitely be a great uh, uh, breakthrough for fuel poverty projects and to collectively reduce carbon footprint in, in our communities. Thank you, Dan, and I'm, um, you know, I'm very happy to respond to any questions. Thanks so much, Edson. Um, so, of course, you can speak with Edson just, uh, just after my colleague Serena's presentation on how actually to use the platform. 
Remo. So as you see, we have some uh, plat some problems using it. Uh, it overloaded uh, my colleague's MacBook, so that's why I have to share the screen. But hopefully, because we're just uh, using the platform for the matchmaking aspect of it, hopefully that will work like very, very well. So let's, you know, fingers crossed. So thank you again, Natsin. Very, very interesting. Always a pleasure to have you. Always a pleasure to uh, to learn about what Equavot is doing and really, really in tune with the strategic research and innovations that we think are really, really useful uh, moving forward. So with that being said, and again, I have no bio document that I can read off of. Luckily, you know, I know this person, Serena, as she's my colleague. And before the pandemic, we used to share an office. Now uh, we share a continent. Yeah, it is what it is. Uh, luckily, we can we work from home quite well. So, uh, Serena Scotton, she is my colleague. She's part of the um, EHPA projects team. She's a project manager here. Uh, she currently manages three projects, um, very specialized in dissemination and communication, uh, training, and all sorts of other activities that, of course, promote heat pumps and the technology itself, and, of course, in proposal writing. Um, I will let her tell more about, you know, what we do at EHPA, at the projects team, and also how... So, Hopefully, uh, after this, we'll all be experts in how to use Remo and in, uh, you know, the calls that we have to participate in. So, Serena, virtual floor and microphone, and you get to order me to, uh, to change the slides. So, <laughs> Thank you very much, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, in the upcoming minutes, I will, uh, as Dan mentioned, I will briefly present you some guidelines on how the networking in the upcoming hour will uh, be held on um, Remo. And I'm going also to briefly present you what are the activities and the projects that uh, uh, we are managing in HPA. Next slide, please. I'll be brief so we don't waste a lot of time and we can focus on networking. So um, in HPA, uh, maybe uh, you already know us because maybe you participate in uh, other um, online workshops and uh, webinars we did in the past months during the pandemic. But yeah, uh, the projects, uh, European projects are at a core activity and uh, core focus that we have in the association. Indeed, we have a project team and you can see here the picture of me and my colleagues. And so an entire team dedicated to European projects. You will uh, meet all of us afterwards during the networking. So our focus on projects is in managing the current um, European projects we have. And uh, we do our work to put the heat pumps at the center of the European energy transition. And we also uh, work hard to make EHPA the go-to partner when we are talking about new projects proposals um, in proposals where, of course, there is a, a room for heat pump. Next slide, please. Uh, currently, EHPA is managing eight European projects. Uh, you can see here the overview and uh, some of the projects were mentioned in the first session. Um, we also have an internal project that is um, here with the SIGLA HPA. Uh, HP, yeah, it is the Heat Pump Award. Um, it, this is an initiative where uh, basically an uh, organization from uh, all around the world, if they have local projects dedicated to a uh, heat pump applied in uh, um, with the uh, local governments or in the tertiary sector, residential sector, industrial processes, uh, if you have an innovative project, you can uh, submit it. And uh, with this project we have, then uh, every year we award four winning projects. Next, please. So apart from doing, let's say, our regular work in the projects we have, we always keep an eye on the future and also to lobby for projects. We have the Research and Innovation Committee inside the HPA, where um, we have many organization stakeholders participating. We meet every two, three months. Uh, during these meetings, we discuss about projects pipelines, the upcoming calls and funding opportunities at European level. And we also discuss what are the research and innovation priorities. 
um, this committee um, is open to everyone, so not only for the HPA members. So if you are interested in these thematics and you want to also do some networking during the year and uh, be always up to date with the new calls for proposals, you can uh, send an email to me or to them and we would be happy to add you uh, in the committee per se. Then during the year, um, of course, we also lobby for projects. Um, Lately, we participate in the lobby to increase the financing um, for, um, for the LIFE program. And we're also very active in participating in the set plan working groups as well in other uh, partnership. Next, please. And always uh, to keep an eye on the future, um, we always look for new opportunities and new partners for uh, projects proposals because as you know, uh, projects are very interesting, but they have a start and uh, end. So we always keep an eye on the new projects proposals. Next slide, please. Um, for this reason, uh, during the year, we always have meetings, usually one one with uh, other organization stakeholders. And also for this reason, because we really care about networking, meeting new stakeholders, new organization and new possible partners for consortia that we came up with this idea today to organize our first match -make, matchmaking event with the networking because we really value the exchange with uh, other European stakeholders because uh, I know that uh, a lot of we know that a lot of organizations are looking at projects proposals and sometimes it's difficult also this pandemic didn't help to meet and uh, get to know each other better. So for this reason, we decided to focus on uh, online networking. Um, indeed, today we would like to meet your organization and get to know also what are the services that, um, for, for instance, you could provide in potential new consortium. Um, and uh, I would also like to briefly uh, present what EHPA does and can provide in uh, projects. So next slide, please. Um, so usually uh, our role in uh, European projects are, um, is as a WP leader in communication dissemination. Um, another core activity that we do is uh, related to governance. Indeed, we, um, as part of services in our association, but it's a service that we also provide in projects, we do um, policy monitoring on the European dossier, uh, mostly related, of course, to energies and that are related to the HIPAM sector. And uh, we also provide and submit policy papers. Then, uh, of course, we benefit from our uh, important network among the HIPAM stakeholders in Europe. So we engage with the stakeholders, but also with European policymakers. And um, we always um, provide HIPAM market analysis, especially related to the European uh, market. And we also sometimes provide training. So these are our services and today we are really keen to know what are yours and better know, let's say, also the other organization because I see here from the participants list that uh, we already know some of the organization but there are some uh, new participants so we are really curious to get to know each other and we will have the time during the networking in a few minutes. Next slide, please. Um, so what uh, EHPA did in the past months was to uh, create a database um, that is actually an Excel file uh, where we selected um, around 40 calls uh, from different funding opportunities going from Horizon Europe, Bauhaus, Life Program and JPP. So we selected uh, these calls that of course are relevant for the EPAM sectors. We put those in a very nice Excel file and we started to set up some meetings with stakeholders to discuss, um, let's say, our priorities, our interests, to see if there uh, really is the opportunity to uh, create some consortia out of, out of it. And uh, also for today's event, uh, uh, just to, uh, let's say, 
give a bit of structure of the networking, um, we structure the different tables. Um, some of them have the uh, title of some calls. So if you are interested, like us, for instance, in this um, course, you can simply join those table. But I'll explain a little bit better this um, in a few moments. But yeah, it's simply to, um, to let you know that we have this Excel file with uh, our priorities and the course that we are interested and you can see it here so it's very easy so we put all the calls we have some information regarding the deadline and the budget with some comments on the content and what is requested in the call per se and then we also um, gave a priority from zero to five of course five is the uh, most important let's say priority for us so we ranked these calls um, next file uh, next slide please in this database we have, um, this is the overview. So of course, from our side regarding the Horizon Europe program, we have a bit more interest in cluster five, climate energy and cluster four, for obvious reason, because let's say they are more close to uh, our sector. But we also identified some very nice opportunities in cluster six and cluster two. Um, as well as other opportunities, both regarding LEF program and Bauhaus. Next slide, please. So just to provide you some guidance on how the networking will happen in a few minutes, we can go on the next. So first of all, um, sorry, here there's some animation. Thank you very much. So if you haven't done yet, on the top right of your, uh, of your screen, you will see a circle with your profile. If you haven't uh, uh, put all your data yet, I suggest you click on there and you add your picture and then your uh, details. So your name, um, headline and also company. What I really recommend to you is to add your LinkedIn um, uh, web link and also a website because uh, when you will sit in a table in one of our virtual tables and it will be way easier for the other participants to simply go with the mouse uh, on top of your icon to see all these details and uh, they could simply click uh, on there and you will see uh, they will be directed to your LinkedIn page and this will be um, will um, yeah this is the overview and this will make uh, things easier also to continue the communication among the stakeholders you will meet today afterwards the event so this could be a really good tool if you can uh, so my suggestion is fill it fill it in with um, more information you can so um, you will uh, it will be very easy for you to meet also after the events with the stakeholders next one please so this is the overview uh, of what will happen in a few minutes so when my colleagues will uh, let's say start the networking part you will see exactly what we are looking here now in the uh, in this slide so we will have a virtual conference room uh, composed by five floors you can see the floors in the left side of the slide um, you can decide in which floor you want to go uh, and in which table you want to go so just to let you know as you see here um, we see that the 80 percent of the tables ha already have um, a title, which is uh, um, the title of some calls we have selected in the database I mentioned to you a few minutes ago. Uh, so if you are also interested in this call, you could simply double click with your mouse, so you will join the virtual table, and then you can start uh, talking about uh, this call and what could be, for instance, um, your uh, proposition or your ideas about this call or the services that you would like to provide if you would be accepted as a uh, possible partner in a consortium related to this call. And of course, all the people that will be at your table are the people interested in the same call as you. Otherwise, if you um, don't see any um, calls that are interesting for you, you could decide to uh, sit in one of the side tables that are free and as you can see there are no titles in those tables so you could do a, let's say a more general networking with other people 
please consider that uh, we have a five floors. In the um, first, second, and third floor, we occupied, let's say, um, we, um, we, we used this structure. But on the fourth and fifth floor, all the tables are three, so free. So there are no titles in there and are available for, let's say, more general networking. Um, so as I said, it's really easy. If you want to move floor by floor, you simply click on the numbers on the floor and you will be redirected to join tables. You simply need to double click uh, on the table that you are interested. Of course, you can join a table only if there are seats available. So it's uh, it really um, it, it really is like in a normal conference. So you have tables with chairs. You can sit only if there is a chair available. Next slide, please. Yes, this is the overview of the fourth and fifth floors. So uh, floors without any labels. So for free discussion. Next one, please. Another click, please. Yes, here, so as I said, you need to double click to join a table. Another click, please. When you are in a table with another person, if you go with your mouse on top of the icon of um, the, the person, you will see uh, here his name, title, company, and all the details and link if this person, of course, added it beforehand. Another click, please. So when you are in a table, if you click on the chat, you will see that you have at your disposal two chats. One is the general chat, the one that we have been using during, these, um, uh, during the webinar today. But you will see that you have at your disposal also the table chat. So if you want to share some links with the other participants, you can easily do. And I suggest you use the table chat instead of the general one. Next slide, please. Um, so when you uh, are in a table, uh, we recommend you to turn on your camera, so to make, let's say, the networking more personal, um, and also to unmute yourself. As you can see here, um, you can have two different views. On the left um, is a view when um, you're in the table, so you can have the small tails with the um, webcams of the people involved in the table. Um, and in this way, you can see at the same time the people on the table, and you can also have an overview on uh, what's going on on the other table. So how many people are meeting. So this is um, the best option if uh, you want to have a look at the other tables because maybe you want to change it because maybe you're not sure to participate in this table. Uh, while the um, picture on the right represents uh, another option. So... Um, you can have, uh, let's say, um, a big, uh, you can um, click uh, on, there is a button on the bottom left when you will be in the network and you can have, a, let's say, a better view on the people involved in the uh, networking. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, so this is it. Uh, so Remo should be quite intuitive during the uh, networking to use. If you have any issues, you can always, uh, let's say, send a message in the general chat so everyone can, um, so ask for, so the people in HPA can read your message and help you out if needed. However, me and my colleague will um, also attend the networking. So yeah, you will not be left alone. We will be there to support. And here is my contact. If you have any contact, you would like to also to set up other meetings after this event to better discuss about projects proposals. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. So we've uh, we've postponed it long enough. Now the platform will change into the its networking phase. Um, feel free to follow what Serena has. Uh, the platform should be quite intuitive, to be honest. And if you have any problems, just look for anyone from uh, EHPA as there's a lot of team members that are around. Um, otherwise, just consider it a normal networking event, just that you're not really there. So after it's over, you can actually just, uh, you know, have a beer. Uh, but we don't have any catering, unfortunately. So you have to bring your own beer. So enough said. Irene, my colleague, will now switch the um, the modes and hopefully everything will work fine fingers crossed
Um, I don't know how many participants there were. Um, I would guess around 100. Um, thank you so much for the speakers. Uh, hopefully you had a chance to speak with them afterwards at the, um, at the networking as well. Uh, if not, um, rest assured because in probably at the beginning of next week, we will send you the all the a link to the presentation we will not send you the presentation itself as it's like 200 megabytes uh in size um and um, the speakers have put their contact details uh, in the presentation slides so you can easily easily contact them uh, we'll also send you the recording of this hopefully we did record it and we pressed the correct button never know with a new platform um, and hopefully you found it useful with the networking. Um, now, again, it's a new tool, but um, you have to adapt to the circumstances. Um, it's quite difficult to make networking events nowadays with the um, you know travel restrictions and everything uh, that is associated with that. Um, also, um, pr the practicality of one to travel for, I don't know, one or two days to participate in a live meeting for one or two hours, maybe. so efficient. Um, so with that being said, we will um, repeat this um, event, this type of event, uh, on the 12th of November. It's already, it's already scheduled. It will use the same platform. Um, it will um, it will use all the same functionality and everything. It even tells me now that it's going to end in two minutes, so that I need to you know um, hurry up. And we hope to we hope to see you there. We hope to see you in the in the. We will of course talk about you know the upcoming calls that are going to happen uh, next year, and you'll also find uh, four speakers that. Believe me, they're very, very interesting. I'm not going to spoil who they are. Um, lastly, if you want to stay connected with you know, the work that we do, the events that are coming up, uh, recordings of events that are going online, um, all sorts of polls and surveys and exchanges about you know, all, basically all the work that the projects team is doing, the key mark that maybe you talked to them uh, during this event, the policy team, and so on. Uh, just check our, check our social media. There's a lot of social media networks. Uh, basically, just following on Twitter or LinkedIn will give you access to most of the things. So with that being said, I'd like to thank everybody from my team. So uh, Serena that presented uh, before, Irene and Danae who were responsible for um, the technical aspects, sometimes working, sometimes not. You know, I blame that on, uh, on their MacBooks. Um, my colleague Laura who is taking notes for the report and everyone else that participated. So with that being said, have a lovely day and enjoy that beer, coffee, or, uh, you know, dinner. Thank you again for participating. Hope to see you again soon. And with that...